people were not experiencing very much tooth decay. And they tried to find out why, and they realized that there's this ideal percentage of fluoride in the water supply. They clench and grind their teeth when they're awake or when they're asleep and develop muscle problems because of that, facial muscle and, and jaw muscle problems and jaw joint uh, injury. Uh, pressure is hurrying to be on time. Stress is hurrying to be late, <laughs> right? You, once you know that there's a time frame here that you need to accomplish it at a certain time and you realize it's impossible to get that done on time, that's stressful. Hi, this is Sifu Slim, author of The Aging Athlete. In this book, you're gonna to get to hear about two different groups of former high-performance athletes. One group, which is made up of 90% of the former athletes, does not do physical activity on a regular basis and tends to suffer the consequences of a sedentary lifestyle. The other group, which is made up of 10% of the former athletes, is doing physical activity on a regular basis and tends to thrive through the aging process, or at least has a better chance at coping with the aging process. We could have taken these folks to a lab, and done all kinds of tests on them. Instead, we slowed them down and sat them down and asked them in their own words to describe why they are wired the way they are so that we all, former athletes and non-athletes, can use some of their inspirational, motivational, and mindset lessons in our own lives. I hope you pick up a copy today. You can go to theagingathlete.com and when you have a chance to read it, I'd love to hear back from you to find out what your thoughts are on the stories of these aging athletes. Hi, this is Sifu Slim, and I am a, a wellness person, a, an athlete, and someone who's interested in everything uh, regarding health, mind, body, and spirit health. And I had the occasion uh, recently at a very important meeting for people about joint replacement from an orthopedic surgeon here in Santa Barbara, California, to meet someone who's got some really cool information to share with us today about athletics, about the mouth, and about how we regular people can take care of our teeth and what the history of the 20th century is when it comes to our care of the mouth and the dealing with new science, new innovation in the realm of dentistry. So I'm, I'm here to welcome uh, Lance Mason, um, who's here in Santa Barbara, has a background in um, fitness, background in rugby and many other things. Lance, maybe you could say hello and uh, share a little bit about your background. Sifu, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I was uh, extremely fortunate to get accepted to dental school. I, I was uh, uh, not a brilliant student in my earlier years. Um, and I, through the mother of a friend, my best mate across the street and growing up in Oxnard, California, she read us some articles about various careers. And I was inspired by dentistry when I was about 15 or 16 and went through undergraduate with that dream. And Toward the end, I was very fortunate to go to a series of lectures by Ray Bradbury when I was at Loyola University in LA, and he inspired me to reapply myself in a way uh, academically, and so I raised the bar a bit and was very fortunate to get accepted at UCLA, and dentistry turned out for me to be perhaps the ideal career. I had grown up with my father working on cars when I was about eight or nine and through my teenage years and building model planes and then model cars and doing really well with that. And dentistry offered the opportunity to expand my interest and knowledge in biology and biological aspects and disciplines, as well as uh, a lot of manual, uh, you know, commands and divans. And it, it just was a brilliant career. I loved doing dentistry and I had the opportunity to teach and Brazil and New Zealand and several different stints at UCLA over time. So I mixed teaching with private practice and a lot of community work. My first job was with the Native American Clinic up near Redding, California, and 
we did a lot of work as students with uh, farm workers, kids out in the Central Valley. And I worked in a clinic that our school set up at the White Mountain Apache Reservation in Arizona. So it was a mixture of teaching and public health and, and private practice and in a, in a field that really suited me well in terms of my interests and, and abilities. So it was a brilliant career for me. And I, I met and interacted with um, dozens and dozens of brilliant colleagues and, and clinicians and uh, was very involved in running continuing education courses, not, not courses that I gave, but hiring speakers of renown around from around the world, both here in the States. And, and when I, I lived 13 years in New Zealand and did a lot of it there as well. So it was great. And, uh, and any contribution I can make to the public's appreciation and understanding of the dedication of dentists toward their welfare, I, I'm happy to participate in that. Wonderful, Lance. You mentioned Oxnard, California. Mm. So uh, I'm sure it was very agricultural based when you grew up there. Is that correct? You nailed it, Sifu. Yeah, for sure. Uh, if I can say this without crossing, you know, subcultural boundaries, that I, I don't want to say anything that is interpreted in the wrong way, but um, I was raised Catholic. And so I went to Catholic school, grade school and high school, uh, Santa Clara grade school, Santa Clara high school. And most of the farmers, the landowners in the area through from the 19th century onward were Irish and German Catholic immigrants. So the, the Mulharts, the Laubachers, Dietrichs, Friedrichs, the Donnellys, the Gills, the McGraths, Mulharts, they were intermarried families of German and Irish Catholics. And so I went to school with the kids of a lot of these families. But I also went to school with the kids of a lot of the farm workers who were Chicano and Mexicano. And so I, I saw a lot of that agriculture was a big, big part of uh, what our whole economy was based on and what our whole subculture in a way was based on. Oh, yeah, it was an interesting time to grow up there. The Bracero program had been started in 1942 to bring more immigrant labor into the California fields as the Dust Bowl migrants began to move into the war industry, World War II. And that Bracero program ended in 1963 and it changed the immigration laws a great deal. And so um, even some of the immigration disputes we have today are based on what happened in the Southwest from the Bracero program, the end of the Bracero program from the time that I was about 16 onward. Yeah, so it was a huge impact on my life. <laughs> So you, uh, you asked me about Sifu and where that name came about. And yeah. um, along the way, I spent a lot of time in Santa Barbara at a place called the Valhalla Elite Training Center. Mm. And the Sifu there is from <clears throat> Oxnard. And he grew up with an older brother oh. who uh, wasn't very, uh, I would say, maybe not as protective uh, in, the, in the thuggery that goes on in the neighborhoods and school. But uh, I think he's two years younger than his older brother, my Sifu, Mike McDonald, turned out to be a natural athlete and a natural fighter. And so he got into martial arts and, and schoolyard battles at a, at a young age. And he was very good at it. He's a and, visual and, learner. And, and sorry to interrupt you, Sifu, but at, at what years would that have been roughly? Do you have a guess? The 80s, 80s and 90s, I would guess. Okay, yeah. Late 70s, 80s and 90s. Right. He was in Oxnard. He's... Um, probably born in right around 1970. Right. And um, so he, you know, he, he'd seen me in action for a long time. And I'm what I would call a hardworking, you know, in, intellectually minded person, a hardworking writer. I get better the harder I work at it. And same thing with athletics. I would say I have natural and hand-eye coordination for many things, but I have, a, you know, a Gilligan body. And so that it works well for Michael Jackson dancing, but it didn't always work well for football and, and sprinting and smashing sports. So I had to learn how to train myself, I would say, better and more diligently and do more recuperation than the other people that were in my neighborhood and school that were the natural, easy, easier to put on muscle type of frames. And so I got into that jacqueline fitness when I was six and I, I have not missed more than three days a year since that time. So it might be, it might be a record. I'm, I'm certain that not, not many people could do 
the hard stuff that I do day in and day out all those years and not hurt themselves and still maintain, you know, vim and vigor and doing it. So it's actually to me a blessing to be able to do that. And it's a curse for me to have to be seated all day. So that's kind of where that Sifu came about. It's not from being a black belt in martial arts, it's from more about being a black belt in balance and in and in fitness and in, in wellness lifestyle. All right. Thank you. So I wanted to ask you, uh, Lance, about athletics. Back in the 70s, I remember reading an article in Sports Illustrated, I think it was, and that was at the time they would have a three or four page article, which I really liked. I remember really this article. Absolutely. Oh, you remember I do. that article? Oh, absolutely. Wow. I do. Yeah. So the, the article talked about the bobsledders and the weightlifters and how the Soviet and the Soviet bloc countries, I believe the plate was metal and it might have been brass or some other softer metal that was built with their, you know, their, their mold. Uh, it was actually, identity. it was, it was acrylic. Acrylic. Okay. Yeah. Hard acrylic. So th- my, my recollection of that article, and I, you know, I might've been 14 or 12 when I read that article was that, you know, an athlete and anyone really for balance and strength that you, you want to have a bite that allows you to do that without harming yourself and to line everything up, yeah. uh, helps your TMJ, helps your posture, helps you with everything. So tell me if that was new news to you at that time, or if you had heard anything uh, in uh, your dental training about uh, those uh, types of athletes. Yes. So the, 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 the physical side of the methodology side is you took a wax wafer. There was a horseshoe shaped wax wafer bit into it. Then that wafer was, we say in dentistry invested, meaning it was, if you will, um, put into a plaster, put into a jig uh, a, a container and, and plaster was filled in around it. And then it, the plaster hardened, you put it in an oven, the wax melted out and you injected acrylic or an acrylic mixture into that. So you ended up with a, a, an acrylic bite plate that fit to your teeth exactly as the wax had done when you impressed it. What this does is it, it allows, in a sense, the, the psychology of the person to bite into this and essentially more readily relax your neck and facial muscles uh, in, a, in a comfortable fitted position And that allowed the other muscles of the body to perform the job that you're applying to them in the course of hammer throws, discus throwing, javelin throwing, weight lifting, all this other, you know, quite rigorous um, demands that you're putting on the, on the athlete. It's, It's a little hard to describe to people that don't work in the field, but I, for many years, on Tuesdays, I only treated people with jaw function disorders and that working with this area was something I had quite a lot of experience in. Luckily, when I was a student at UCLA at the dental school, uh, William Solberg was one of our professors and he was a world leader in the research that went into this based on a lot of research done by a guy at um, Ann Arbor, University of uh, Michigan Dental School. Um, who was uh, a real guru around the world in this area. So it, it was something, it's a very real science in dentistry and it's a very real um, malady for a lot of people who have joint disorders and jaw f- function disorders and facial muscle and masticatory chewing muscle disorder because of the... Um, it's almost always related to stress. They clench and grind their teeth when they're awake or when they're asleep and develop muscle problems because of that facial muscle and and jaw muscle problems and jaw joint uh, injury from that. So what these bite plates did was, if you will, it's a bit hard to describe this, took the whole potential for facial dysfunction out of the equation when they were performing athletics Um, you can analogize it to a number of different things, but that's essentially what it did. And it was a very real, had a really real effect on people's performance. Have you heard of anyone in the last 10 to 15 years still working in that field or any large group of like an entire Olympic bobsled team or anyone 
using these tech using this technology in the in the recent times no i haven't um and it's something i'm very if you want to say it this way sensitive to because i worked in that field a lot and i haven't heard anything or seen anything any reference to it in any way in terms of high performance sports do you think there was a, a valid reason for having that disappear or is it just the older coaches that were connecting with the the dental lab people and the dentists um they 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 retired and the, the information somehow didn't transfer to the next generation um yeah there's the changes that have happened in dentistry and where and the focus of dentistry over the last two to three decades has changed tremendously um one of the things that we see here and all around the world is a a, a, a great reduction in dental caries, tooth decay, in a in number of generations. I mean, the years that I lived in New Zealand, uh, and New Zealand was a world leader in the in fluoridation of uh, community water supplies, uh, we saw patients that were in their 30s and in their 40s who had never had one cavity in their entire mouth their entire life. So the, 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 the changes in the demands on dentists uh, has changed what is taught in dental schools and what is practiced in dentistry. Um, there's a great deal more cosmetic dentistry or aesthetic dentistry now is a focus in care and a lot less um, caries, dental caries, dental decay treatment and, and focus because of this reduction. So that's one aspect, a big rise in aesthetic dentistry. The other one is implantology, uh, which is a, a fabulous science and, and a fantastic addition to the, um, as we say in dentistry, the armamentarium, the, the opportunities and the disciplines that are available for dentists to provide to the public. Um, mm -hmm. But this is an area, uh, I don't think there's been a big growth uh, in the profession with um, the number of dentists who are um, utilizing the science behind jaw functions, jaw function disorder. And I don't want to shortchange that. There are, there are quite a number of dentists out there who are very devoted to this field, but it hasn't grown to the same degree that aesthetic dentistry and, um, and implantology has grown. Uh, so uh, I, I think it's an extremely important behavior uh, to, to monitor. The, the, if, if you want me to talk about stress and the relation of stress to this field and human behavior, that's something I'm pretty familiar with and happy to talk about that, Sifu. Yeah, Lance, that sounds great. Let me uh, share just a couple of um, uh, comments that I've heard from people in, uh, in the wellness field. One person ha has done, I think the number he told me was 12,000 massages and sports massages and he grew up in a wellness family and he did that in hawaii and the reason he changed over to egoscue therapy more uh, exercise and postural um, positions uh, and therapeutic exercises than massage was because the people kept coming back after the massage a week later these athletes or these people who sat in a job or stood at a counter with the same problems. And he said, what, what can I give these people that would alleviate some of these problems? And uh, you go in there and he takes five pictures of you. You're in your shorts and he'll take them from different angles and he'll show you the plumb line. That would be a more correct plumb, plumb line and where you're just in your standing position or out of balance. And he'll give you exercises based on the things he sees for that. And then you come back in a few months later, he checks you out and he's getting a lot better results from that. And that to me is more like changing the bite or an orthotic on the, on the foot. You, will, you allow that to enhance the, the way you, you use your body and the postures and the, the landing position of the foot, the pressing off position of the foot. So I think that, you know, I, I think massage is wonderful. I think physical therapy is wonderful, but you do want to improve your postures, sitting, standing, running, et cetera throughout your life if if you're that if you're minded that way and i think that's going to provide more benefit than the band-aid that uh, sometimes is used on the ibuprofen pill and uh, and the and the massage well uh you struck on a very important term sifu uh, the orthotic that is actually the the correct term for 
the bite plates that we fit people with, they're properly called orthotics, which basically means straight. And it doesn't mean straight, like necessarily a straight line. It means properly aligned uh, in that sense of straight. Um, yes. I, I, um, th those, I mean, what you're talking about, giving the people a massage and having them come back with the problem is a little bit, and don't, I don't want people to, take this in the wrong sense, but um, he's treated the problem, but hasn't, he's treated the results of the problem, but hasn't educated the people on how to change what they're doing so that they don't come back with the problem again. Uh, and, and, and I'm not pointing fingers or anything, but that's, it's important to, to differentiate treating the symptoms or the outcomes versus changing the, the cause and treating the the behavior or whatever it is that's that's bringing the problem on so in my coaching of people on physical movement which i think is our birthright and it's a joy to be able to dance to be able to look at a at a good what would i call it a, phys, a physical amount of tissue on your body that you're seeking you know like the, the gentlemen who and ladies as well who have to swim across the english channel um, you know, this large frame man, I think he gains 45 pounds before he does that. And I think in his one swim, he loses those 40 pounds. That's an amazing amount of work that your, your system has to do, burn through that fat and handle the waste products. But that's, that's for that person. But for someone who wants to look good uh, in a bathing suit, let's say, and be able to climb with their hands up a rope or a, a jungle gym or something like that, there's a certain physical look. You don't have to be Jacqueline, but you have to be closer to Jacqueline than, than a couch potato would be. And so what I tell people, I said, look, you care about your teeth. So you're going to floss it. You know, usually once a day, people floss before they go to sleep at night and they, and they brush their teeth and maybe rinse out properly. And so you do that once a day. And I, and I said, out of 24 hours, do you think you can move your body for a half an hour in a physically challenging way and invigorating way in a wellness sort of way oh yeah i think i can do that okay so that that's the that's the base now if you want to do a transformational workout and you want to lose some weight you're gonna to have to change diet you're gonna to have to change you know doing more potential uh, physicality more regular physicality throughout the day if you have a back problem you're certainly gonna to have to more, do more physicality throughout the day certain stretches certain uh, leg ups knee ups those types of things and hip exercises, et cetera. So there's a whole myriad of things you have to do. But I say it's just like flossing your teeth. That has a purpose. And the physicality of your daily movement has a purpose. And if you do thrive with that movement, it now becomes joy in movement. And that's what you want to get to. You want to get beyond the transformational fitness and into the maintenance, joy, and recreation. So you're, you are your own Michael Jackson, and you're moving like Bruce Lee in your own little way. And I think that that's where we need to be, not the fitness for a penalty for being sedentary and a penalty for being overweight. What do you think about that, Lance? I think that if you can inject joy into people's dental flossing, Sifu, you're doing a fantastic job for dental, public dental health. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, everybody gets enjoyment and thrills and enthusiasm from different things. For me, uh, the great, just coincidental, I've got house guests here today. And they're, they're, today's their last day with me. They're leaving tomorrow. Uh, they're here for a rugby reunion. These is guys from a team I played with in 1968 uh, when I was just getting into rugby and we won a big championship that year. And it was like, the term I use a bit coarse is a, it was like mainline heroin for me. Uh, the the enjoyment of the what my relationship with these guys on my team meant at the time and what it continues to mean more than fifty years later. That's that's the huge thrill, the joy that I found. That the, I'm never any good at uh, at individual sports. I'm only ever good at team sports. Uh, we set a we set a record that we held for 14 years, or a bicycle race across the United States. We set a record for our age group uh, in in 2007, uh, and that didn't that 
age group record didn't get broken for 14 years. And I was the project manager and part of the race team for that. And I only could have done that in a team situation. I could never have done that solo because there are guys who do this race solo. And I was never a distance runner. I was never anything good in it. And so for me, that huge joy of physicality is in team sports and in the, what you share with the other guys on the, on the pitch when you're playing. And, but I have a close, close friend whose son is a decathlete and Wyatt gets his, his thrills in decathlon where it's this totally individual sport, you know, 10 sports all at once. So different people. And I think that's, it's the culture you come out of. It's what your young, your experience as a young person were and, and where your mind, what your mind wraps around in terms of the enjoyment of life. It's interesting that um, when you talk about dentistry, Lance, you you think about your checkups. I mean, a, a, a person with a healthy mouth and healthy hygiene, they think about their checkups, um, which are maybe twice a year for someone like Jerry Seinfeld, who has a beautiful teeth and perhaps a really good bite. And he's in, he's in the uh, dental commercials where he's holding up his lips and he's showing his teeth, you know, or maybe not commercials, but I've seen him in dental offices and they've used that. And I don't know how he got into that promotion, but he happens to have a good set of chompers. Now we, we go to medicine and a lot of people in the medical community would consider themselves operating on a preventive basis. And I haven't seen that much of that. I've seen lots of testing so you can prevent someone from having worse problems. So you can say, okay, here you are now, and we're looking for cancer. We're looking for high blood pressure. So we're, we're using a diagnostic test to find out what problems you currently have. But I don't see a lot of uh, the medical community taking a look at a person who's fit and well and saying you're 18, now, how are we going to keep you that way for the rest of your life? That's something I haven't seen. And what I wanted to mention to you is that I was uh, happy to find that 1970s meeting where I don't know if it was the ADA. You can fill me in a little bit more. But some dental group got together in San Francisco in, I believe, the early 1970s. And they made a plan, a strategic plan to say, we are going to operate on a new model. We've got lots of carries in the mouth. We've got lots of sugar eating people. We're going to help the kids and keep them well for the rest of their lives. And we're going to operate on this preventive model. So maybe you can fill us in on, on that type of philosophy and, and how sure. maybe mainstream medicine could yeah. use that strategic plan and what they do. Sure. Sifu. It's, it is, in my opinion, a, a very, very important field. I'm being master of the obvious there. Um, and I have a lot of friends, a lot of colleagues, and I say colleagues because we did, you know, cross paths and in, in clinical management, uh, who are doctors. And the thing to keep in mind is we have in dentistry a very narrow field of responsibility. Doctors have an inc almost, infin almost infinitely broader field of responsibility. So when you talk about prevention and preventive medicine and dentistry, you're talking about a fairly narrow band of, of health care and, and health um, problems, you know, tooth decay being the most, the most, the one that most people have, have um, experienced in the past. Um, and so when you're saying, okay, what's our best way to prevent tooth decay? It, it's a pretty straightforward and pretty narrow field. And that's basically water fluoridation. That's the, the single greatest public health um, benefit worldwide in cultures around the world. Uh, it was discovered more or less, if you will, by accident in some Italian villages where people, where white sugar and, and these things were available in the diet, and yet people were not experiencing very much tooth decay. And they tried to find out why, and they realized that there's this ideal percentage of fluoride in the water supply in these villages. And if you, the science is pretty straightforward. Um, I don't wanna bore people with it, but essentially your body builds the enamel on your teeth 
at, in, during childhood inside your jaws. And then when the teeth are ready to come through, they come through and the floor, the, the enamel is layered onto your dentin, the underlying part of your tooth in layers. And if you put fluoride into the bloodstream during this time, fluoride is incorporated into each layer of that crystallization. And it makes the enamel of the teeth impervious to the acid the mouth bacteria produce from sugar. So mouth bacteria metabolize sugar. They produce acid from that and the acid eats into the tooth enamel. If you have fluoride incorporated into the layers of that tooth enamel, that acid can't break down the tooth enamel. And that's a very simple explanation of how fluoride makes tooth impervious. Well, that's a pretty simple field compared to diabetes, heart disease, et cetera, all the things that medicine has to deal with. So that's part of it. And then there are, you know, keeping your teeth clean so that your gums don't get inflamed to disease. Yes, that's important in dentistry as well, but again, a fairly narrow field. We were, and I, I feel fortunate to have worked in dentistry where the preventive process was pretty straightforward. I didn't have to, you know, deal with the huge problems that general practitioners in, in medicine have to deal with all the time with all this, you know, all, all their patients. But on the other hand, uh, in medicine is the old divide and conquer philosophy, Sifu, that if you take all the various specialties in medicine and instead of focusing on how to treat these diseases, you focus each subdiscipline of medicine focuses on how to prevent it, then it would go a long ways to what you're idealizing here. What you're talking about is let's get more preventive medicine out there into the channels of care and see if we can't reduce the incidence of these diseases and the severity of them instead of just focusing on how do we treat them. Yeah, that, that's great, Lance. So what happened to me is I wrote my first book, Sedentary Nation. I saw that. That's yeah. The, yeah, history of physical movement from the hunter-gatherers to the through the farmers, through the industrialists, to the service-oriented couch, desk, and car potatoes. So that gave me this really good grasp on social history, history in general, and also diet and the changes of diet, especially in the 20th century. And then I wrote the second book, The Aging Athlete. And in my first interview with a, a gentleman who was on the cover of that book, Randy Beisler up in Marin County, mm. he was the number three pick of the 66 NFL draft. I said, Randy, when you go to the commemoratives and golf tournaments with the guys from the 60s and 70s, how many, not just the linemen, but how many of those athletes are still practicing regular physical activity? And he said less than 10%. So since then, I've interviewed about 2,000 people, and all but six have said it's less than 10%. So that, that's a pretty good anecdotal study, and I'm hoping if, if somebody's connected to a university or research facility, to connect me with a group who some postdocs and other people we could do an official scientific study on that. But while I was working on, uh, on the marketing on that book, a parent told me, he, she said, look, you're talking to the people who are already too busy and, and too overwhelmed by everything and are out of shape. Why don't you go after the coaches and the parents and talk about kids and talk about the sustainable wellness approach and join recreation and maintenance stuff that you're into at a very young age and, and instill that into these young minds. And I said, oh, that makes a lot of sense. And I'd, I'd like to see medicine operate in that paradigm. And so here's an example of what I would do if I were in charge, the new czar of, of medicine. Uh, I would, first of all, I would tie in money and insurance premiums to the way you're taking care of yourself, not if you have genetic problems and if not, if you've had an accident, but the way you're taking care of yourself, just like the English people, you don't get um, certain um, organ replacements. If you're a smoker or if you're a drinker, you, you go to the back of the line, you're likely never going to get it. So I would start with the, the money and then I would do some tests. I would say, okay, you're learning about posture. You're six, eight, 10, 12 years old. So we're going to test you on posture and your annual or your biannual appointment at the doctor's office so that the iPhone or the computer isn't tilting you over. Whatever you're doing is not tilting you over. I would say muscle mass. So even a thin guy like me, there's an, op there's an appropriate amount of muscle mass that I should have on my body. Breathing, 
Do you know how to breathe using your diaphragm and relaxation? How's your gut health? That's very easy to test for. How's your aerobic fitness? So those are five things that I would do if I were the czar of medicine. And tell me what you think, Lance, about some of this philosophy. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the difficulty that we have in dealing with general populations is that there's a great variety of what people consider to be um, I don't want to call it idealized exactly for want of a better term, you know, an idealized existence. If athleticism and muscle mass and the ability to perform on a treadmill or a bicycle or, you know, whatever physical challenges you want to put before people and see them, you know, uh, try to meet those challenges. But there's lots and lots of people in populations who don't, who don't relate to that at all, who have no interest in athletics, who have, you know, their interests are a whole myriad of interests, right? Uh, so, so it's difficult to say that these are the standards that we want to put out there or the, 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 the expectations that we want to put out there for a population of people, because what you and I consider to be uh, valuable and worthwhile pursuits for health and wellness and, and longevity and longevity with enjoyment and health, a lot of people, those things don't mean anything at all. They're, they're much more comfortable with having a cigarette and a couple of beers with their mates in the pub and, uh, you know, et cetera. And, and I don't condemn that at all. It's just that to, in order to make it work for a large population, I don't know. They're, 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 I don't know how you would set up the parameters for this sort of, I don't want to call it testing, but, you know, but uh, for one of a better term, testing uh, the parameters of, of, um, of, to pursue, you know, we have to keep in mind that we've got a whole population of people with very different views, subcultural views on, on what they want out of life. Um, so that's, that's the tricky bit, you know, and, in dentistry, it's it's pretty narrow of what you're what you're pursuing. In medicine, it's much much broader. Yeah, there's a of course in the in the modern era, there's a fear about telling anyone anything that's a criticism. But when it comes to correct, <laughs> you know, our generation of handing in a paper in elementary school or high school, it was common that the teacher would read your report and critique it right there in front of everyone else. Um, the PE teacher uh, would do the same thing, um, urging you on. And so I'm not saying that that was all good. It definitely, there were, there were a lot of subtleties there that were injurious to people. But what I would say, uh, if I compare it to dentistry, if you don't take care of your teeth, you can't eat. Um, you, you and I exchanged an email where I said, um, based on this great article that I, I happened upon, what happens in the mouth doesn't stay in the mouth, which is a takeoff of what, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, that type of thing. And so you use some of these things and you work it into the education of a young person where we had those military tests that came about in seventh and eighth grade. They, these were standards that the military had to use. So we use that at seven or seventh or eighth grade, we didn't have to perform at the level that an 18 or 20 year old had to do, but we used those military tests um, in our in our curriculum in seventh and eighth grade. And I thought that was wonderful. And, and when I look back in my seventh and eighth grade pictures, I would say that more than 90% of the kids I went to the junior high school with, we cared about how well we did in PE. We cared about getting picked on the teams. We cared about how we looked and achievement and learning. We, we really cared. And we did our, our, most of us did our utmost to excel the best, to the best of our abilities. And when I study these, these pe people getting pulled out of anywhere across the United States that went into World War II, they were a very caring group of patriotic people that when they left World War II, they cared about the next thing, which might have been college might have been their job might have been starting a family they weren't perfect 
but they tended to be very caring people about using their time to their utmost to get some sort of an achievement, something produced. Yes, they had a good time. They, they went out and blew off steam, some of them too much drinking and what have you. But this whole idea of not being apathetic, I think was prevalent in my generation, yours and the, the World War II people. I think somewhere in the 80s and 90s, this idea of apathy introduced was introduced into the culture and has become so common right now that um, I'm not afraid to reinvigorate the, the what I was talking about. And I think to overcome apathy, you have to show people what it means to thrive and to care about themselves and their community. Fifu, I certainly couldn't phrase it any better than you have. Um, I I have a hard time focusing, you know, getting a focused outlook on this. Um, you know, we I grew up in a period of time when, um, yeah, post World War II. You know, my my family was very involved in that the culture that grew out of World War II. My dad was in the Navy for 24 years, and then he worked as a civilian for the Navy for another 24 years. Um, and I was around, I worked, I lived in, uh, Oxnard had two naval bases and an Air Force base. And so we were very part of that post-war culture. Um, and yeah, the, the pursuits that came out of the American culture during that time seemed very, very, principled and worthwhile uh and it's harder for me to relate to um those, the, the principles of of the uh the, the that came out of the late 90s and on into the the, the 21st century um yeah it, it's it's difficult for me to comment on that because um i don't have children i've never been married so i I, I never had to participate particularly in that in, in the in the child rearing of those era of that era. Um, it's a tough one. Yeah. It's a tough one. And I and I guess the the piece that I want to express to any viewers of this is that I'm a very caring person. I'm I'm also saddened by some of this trajectory. I'm also saddened by some of the horrors of World War II. Um, I'm um, saddened by many things, you know, the, the place of a woman in, in certain generations and the, um, you know, the, the laws being written in favoring men. There are a lot of things you can critique about the past, but I, the idea of apathy, I'm, I, I, when I look at history, I don't see that many examples of apathy. You can find it in Rome at the height of the Roman civilization. Um, they were the lower end of the people were doing lots of the work and the upper echelon of the people became uh, at certain times very sedentary. So they weren't hunting, they, they weren't farming, they weren't gathering, they weren't working with their hands. There was a lot of sitting on their butts in this giant bureaucracy where they actually lived in, in condominiums. I think at one point in Rome, at the height of the civilization, I think there were 60,000 condominiums in the city of Rome. So there was a lot of sedentary behavior and apathy did work its way into that. And then the Roman uh, civilization, first the Eastern, uh, or the, sorry, the Western, and then the Eastern Roman civilization crumbled. So, but now in the modern era, looking at the, uh, the rise of the internet, the rise of convenience and all these types of things, um, it, it, it alleviates us from having to use our bodies. So I jokingly, share to people that in the modern era, what is the job of the human body? And since we live in our heads, the job is to carry around the head. So tell me what your thoughts are on that. <laughs> you know, I, you, again, Steve, it seems like you nailed that pretty well with a pretty good analogy. Uh, you know, um, I think, yeah, yes, I, I, I agree with you a lot. I, I don't know that apathy is the word that would come to my mind about what I see, I, I think there's something important that the world, that, that humans understand subliminally, but maybe needs to be articulated is that if you make a goal too difficult to achieve, what you end up with is apathy because 
because if the if I don't want to lose that train of thought, but if you look at the the Roman Empire at its peak, and you said, okay, how could what do we need to do to make this better? What is it, what is the goal to make this better? There was no perception among human beings at the time that it could be any better than the Roman Empire was. So the goal of making it better was un, unachievable, and the result of that was that people became apathetic because they they couldn't focus on what they needed to do to make something better when it was when making it better seemed unachievable. So, so I think part of, part of this is that um, if, if I don't know what I call it apathy, but um, is see to me, it, I had a fairly simple system as I grew up, as I was growing it, 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 and, and it was a, system handed to me is goal setting you want to live live a goal oriented life maybe that's what you're talking about the opposite of apathy is being goal oriented and you set your goals you figure out a plan to pursue those goals and you figure out a method to execute the plan to get to the goals it's a pretty simple life plan and i was fortunate to be inspired to work that way and, and i say in, in the narrow sense of being inspired in, in dentistry uh, it was the same in, in rugby and, and rugby and dentistry were big focuses of mine throughout my life. And, um, and so I think that's something that, you know, people need to, to, and there's a crit and there's a critical part of this Sifu that I think you'll definitely relate to is that when you set a goal or goals, they need to be closely aligned with what your personal values are. You need to understand what your personal values are. You need to study those a bit in your life so that you understand what those values are because your goals need to be aligned with those values. Because if they don't, you're going to put a lot of time and a lot of effort and a big piece of your life in the pursuit of those goals and you're going to achieve them and you're not going to be gratified and you're not going to be satisfied because you've pursued something that isn't aligned with your values. Um, so if there is a degree of apathy, it might be that, that creating or pursuing uplifting goals, it, people today find that hard to do. Um, and they ha have a hard time working out the plan to pursue those goals and a method to execute the plan. Um, yeah, I, I think there has been, you know, and, and something that, I don't know your age, Sifu, but I'm 75. Um, and people say, oh, these old white men pontificating about how life should be. And they had it, the led, led privileged lives, you know, because of who they are and the cultures they come out of. But on the other hand, if I can say this, um, we do care about other people. And we are, we've been around a long time. We've seen a lot of mistakes and we've, we are a certain degree frustrated by the repetition of mistakes and that we have not been able to breed a culture that stops making the same mistakes over and over. So yeah. we sound like you know, pontificated and complaining old men is because, because we have, we have a certain degree of frustration at not having created a better world in all aspects. I think we've created a better world in many ways, but, not on all aspects. And when I say we, I don't mean old white men. I mean the culture at large. Um, so I, I would, I want to leave the world a better place than where, how I found it. If that's through dentistry, then good on me. Um, and uh, I think that there needs to be a whole lot more. And I think this is what we saw in the aftermath of World War II is there was a whole lot more common pulling together. Um, and I think if I can say this, the, the civil rights advances in the 60s came, was in part part of the post-World War II culture where Americans really desired to make the world a better place for all of the common populace. Um, there were segments of America culturally as well as geographically that weren't on board with that. But, um, but I think generally the civil rights advancements our credit to uh, those minorities who suffered the results of a long history of, of, of discrimination, 
but also the other side of the equation of people who uh, who wanted a better place for all Americans and were willing to support the civil rights actions um, that were happening then. Um, so, I, you know, we need a greater and a wider um, um, pursuit of the common good in America and, and less, I mean, it's, I'm master of the obvious here, less division. We need to focus not on how do we make these, how do I take my division and make it dominant? <laughs> it's how do I take my division and blend it better with the other divisions so that we come up with more support for what's the common good of our society. You asked me, uh, Lance, how old I was. Thank you for, first for uh, first of all for sharing that great great uh, perspective. Um, you asked me how old I was, so I'm going to see if my birthday card. Um, <laughs> can you see it there? It says Yippee Pie. So there's a piece of pie. Yippee IA. Yes, I see it. Yeah. And I just turned sixty uh, a mm. week and a half ago, and so I wanted to share with you. This pie, blueberries, which is pretty cool. In French, they're called les bleus. Mm. Um, and so there's that. What would happen if a jaguar or a leopard in the zoo was fed sugary pie? Uh, maybe they eat three meals a day. What would, what would happen if 20% of their calories was from a sugary pie and they had that three times a day? Would they have dental caries or do they have a different... Um, system that would allow enable them to handle those those uh, sugar calories so so back into the, the earlier part of the discussion um uh oral plaque is the, the the creamy sticky stuff that you're cleaning off when you're dental flossing and um and toothbrushing and it is a colony of bacteria uh that who they create um um, they create chemicals, if you will, that adhere them, that give them the stickiness. So they stick to your teeth. And in that very concentrated colony of bacteria, they're extremely efficient at producing acid from especially white sugar, but other carbohydrates as well, but especially white sugar, because the, the, the sugar molecule of white sugar is very easily broken down into acids. So in order for that, for blueberry pie or any you know, sugary material to create tooth decay in the mouth of any animal, that animal has to have a, a bacteria that has the ability to metabolize the sugar, create acid, so the acid can eat away the tooth enamel. Um, so I, I don't answer that question because I don't know what the bacterial colonies are in jaguars or leopards or monkeys or, but um, I think for the most part, human beings are the only animals that suffer from dental caries. I don't think tooth decay happens in other animals. Uh, gum diseases do, some, some animals do lose teeth through gum disease, but I don't think any other animals suffer from tooth decay. Now it's probable and this is something I have a very strong feeling for evolution, it's probable that that hasn't happened uh, because those animals haven't been exposed to sugar-containing foods. So the bacteria that metabolize sugar haven't evolved into a dominant bacterial culture in the mouths of these animals because sugar hasn't been there to create a favorable environment for them. So sorry, sur survival of the fittest. If you, if you only, let's look at it this way, this is extreme, but if you only fed an animal sugar, Sifu, and you didn't feed them anything else, then the, you probably would end up growing bacterial cultures in the mouths of those animals that thrived on sugar. And if you did that, you probably would introduce dental caries into those animals' mouths. Uh, but that's never been done to my knowledge. And so I, I think that um, we don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I, I don't know um, how many animals eat fruit. I know there's, there are um, videos online of 
variety of animals. I think it's in the tropics, maybe sub-Saharan Africa. And they're eating these rotten, not plums, but some, something that they're getting drunk on. So they eat a bunch of these and a giraffe is falling over and, you know, acting like a drunk person at a party. The uh, and, Gods Must and, Be Crazy movie. Yeah. Remember the that? are doing it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There was a film made about what you're talking about. And then there was a, a feature film made of it. There was a documentary made about what you're talking about. And then there was a, a, a humorous film about the, the Kalahari Bushman. Uh, but a lot of it was the same thing. Yes. Uh, yeah. They, the, the fruit falls off, it ferments, and then they eat it. But mm -hmm. that's not refined sugar. Mm -hmm. Refined sugar is the real killer. Mm -hmm. uh, if there was, if, if we can eliminate, if we can ra radically reduce uh, the access to and the and the participation in smoking, we should also be doing the same thing with white sugar. It's a terribly destructive material in our diet. There, um, I in my book, I I do um, cite a study that um, looked at the Inuit tribal people of uh, of Alaska. Yep, and they they showed that they had um, no limited, very limited vision problems when they lived uh, as they did in the early 20th century. And then when they were brought in for schooling of their kids and other things and fed a Western diet, and this goes way back to like the 1920s through 50s, yep. when they, in, in within a very short period of time, I think it was under a year, they would uh, develop um, a farsightedness so they they needed glasses in order to read yeah. um and so it immediately affected them i'm sure it affected their their dental caries etc because it's such a high sugar diet that they yeah. were exposed to and they hadn't been exposed to that but when i sent you an email about access to sugar in the ice belt you said uh, you know you wanted to share something about that i didn't i didn't know where people in the ice belt would have gotten sugar from natural sources like in in the in the tundra type areas uh unless it was berries that would be there for a very short growing season maybe and i know in steamboat springs their growing season i think it's under two months so um share with me what you will about the uh, sugar access in the it, ice belt okay it, it's interesting in a way not not to belabor the the point uh not only is sugar interesting to look at from the standpoint of dental caries, but sugar is very interesting to look at from the standpoint of athletic performance. So the, the problem with dentistry and dental tooth decay is refined sugar, uh, sucrose, sucrose or dextrose, which is another version of sucrose. So when you, when the labeling laws came in um, and people started relating the presence of sugar, white sugar, sucrose in foods with adverse health, the manufacturers of packaged foods began to change what they called sucrose so they could name it different things and put it further down on the list of what's on, because the, the, the ingredients list has to be by, by what's most, what's most, the most of what's in there. So the first item is what's the most, the biggest ingredient. The second one is the second biggest ingredient and so forth. Well, if they could name it sucrose and dextrose and all these other sugar, uh, you know, um, corn syrup and so forth, they could put it further down the list and make it look as though there's less sugar in the product. Um, but, but the reason that sugar, that white sugar, that sucrose and, and derivatives of white sugar are the, the killer is that that is what mouth bacteria create the highest acid concentration of the fastest. So in from 10 to 20 seconds of introducing that food in your mouth, the acid in your mouth peaks, like it hits a peak very quickly. And that acid, be, you know, attacks the, the dental uh, enamel very quickly and, and continues to as long as sugar's around and as long as the plaque has acquired that sugar and, and continues to use it. When you're talking about sugar from other sources, fructose, which is fruit sugar, uh, glucose from other sources, they are not nearly as efficient for the bacteria at producing acid as white sugars are, as refined sugars and other refined carbohydrates. So if you take an indigenous culture or pick a culture, 
um, and they are acquiring sugars from the foods they're eating, those are not refined sugars and they're not nearly as destructive in terms of the risk of tooth decay. Um, but sidebar, if I will, if I may for a moment, um, because athletic and athletics performance is something you're very, very oriented to. And I'm assuming that many of your YouTube viewers are. Um, there's a very, very good book. Uh, and, and maybe you're very familiar with it because uh, I actually hired this guy for a, a course for dentists, uh, Covert Bailey. And you know, Covert Bailey is, yeah. So he wrote a book He's called fit, Covert Bailey. Fit, fit or Fat. Uh, he's the guy that that originated uh, water immersion for measuring body fat. Uh, a very prominent uh, Olympic athlete, Frank Shorter, was the the guy that he used when he did his doctorate at MIT on in exercise physiology. Um, there are two sources of energy for athletic exertion or any exertion in the body: free fatty acids in the bloodstream and blood sugar. And blood sugar is a much, much smaller fuel tank than free fatty acids. But free fatty acids are, can only be consumed in aerobic exercise, which is a lower work rate exercise, a very enduring exercise, uh, but a lower work rate. You can only produce a real high work rate exertion by burning blood sugar. Uh, and and the, the duration of that high exertion is pretty small. You know, that's why, um, you know, the 400 meters is, a, is the longest sprint you can do, right? Because you only have 40 seconds of that, 40 to 45 seconds of that exertion capacity during one exertion experience, right? It's why the splits in running a mile or running 1500 meters are super important because you need to divide your high exertion blood sugar consumption part of that exercise with your free fatty acid behavior so you've got to you've got to you know restrain that sprint in the first lap to a certain period of time restrain the sprint in the second lap to a certain period of time and the third lap so on the fourth lap you have the ability to finish off with a hard sprint uh and come over that line completely exhausted of blood sugar mm -hmm. uh, an example of of this is when you see people doing triathlons and you see people doing marathons uh, or, or any long distance run, for example, the people who, sorry to say this, but they wet their pants or they get delusionary. And the reason for that is very interesting. Your brain only operates on blood sugar. Your brain has no capacity to operate in free fatty acids. So as you're depleting the blood sugar that's available, the brain steps in and says, no, no, that's it. You can't, you can't take any more of my sugar. I need the rest of that for me to function. And so you can only sprint, blah, 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 right? For the, the 40 seconds, you can only, and part of the 800 meters, you can do part of the 800 meters as a sprint because I need the rest of that. Human beings are able to train themselves to overcome the demands of the brain and take more blood sugar out of their system in the physical exercise than the brain wants them to take. And when they, when they pass that threshold, the brain function starts to break down. And that's when you see people doing what we're talking about, wetting their pants, getting delusionary because you've taken too much blood sugar away from the brain. Yeah, the um, fascinating thing, Lance, that I, I ran across in my research is, and it's easy to find, but I hadn't looked at it until maybe 14 years ago. I'm looking into some of this stuff and I saw that we use, I think, 33% or something along those lines. Uh, let's say a fit athletic person, our calories are burned by our brain. And so imagine somebody no, who's got but a, only the only blood sugar calories. Yeah, blood sugar calories, correct. So blood sugar calories, 30 some percent is used by the brain. Imagine Einstein or someone. And then I, I talked with somebody who's uh, very much a student of hunter gatherers. And I said, okay, I'm going to give you a Three groups. Um, we'll take hunter gatherers in the 1600s. We'll take farmers in the 1800s. And we'll take modern computer savvy people who spend 12 hours a day on a computer. I said, who's burning more calories, uh, sugar calories in their brain? And he said, the hunter gatherers. And his opinion was, is that they went through periods of fasting where they didn't have anything. So they're 
you know, they're doing that, converting it uh, in their system to glycogen and burning that in their brain. And then they are also worried about being invaded. They're worried all the time. So there are tribes that like the Hawaiians might have had a better food source with fish and these things. But I used I used the Sioux Indians in the 1600s in uh, in Kansas. So he he used that in his in his uh, in his uh, calculations for this. And I said, what about the modern people who are living in a stress filled life? We're worried all the time. We've got busy minds. Uh, all these types of things. He says, nope. He said, he's going to pick the hunter gatherers uh, out of all those people. Even with the 1800 farmers going through tough times, he said, he still, still pick the hunter gatherers. Maybe you have a thought on that. I, I absolutely have a thought on that. <laughs> <clears throat> um, and, and maybe this, if you don't mind, maybe this will be our concluding conversation for now, yeah. uh, Sifu. And, and, um, stress is a very, very big component of bruxism clenching and grinding your teeth stress is and there's two ways to look at this people say oh my husband he's he thrives on stress or my friend my you know whatever no people don't thrive on stress they thrive on pressure so pressure mm -hmm. is uh, you, you you have demands that need to be met but your system of dealing with those demands your great staff you have or your 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 plan and exercise or whatever really equip you for achieving that goal achieving that work demand in a certain period of time to a certain level or above but you're organized and you're going to to do that and that's pressure but it's not stress stress is a perception of threat okay uh, pressure is hurrying to be on time stress is hurrying to be late right you once you know that there's a time frame here that you need to accomplish it at a certain time and you realize it's impossible to get that done on time that's stressful it's, it's not pressure. And you're, you're seeing failure in your own behavior. Mm -hmm. Failure in regards to your relationships with other people, failure in regard to the IRS that's after you, failure in mm -hmm. regards to your divorce, your children, wh whatever your, your final exams are coming up. When you see failure as inevitable, that's very stressful. And it stimulates lots and lots of physiological behavior that is bad for you. Um, and stress is what causes people to clench and grind their teeth. Why teeth? Why don't you scratch your eye or, or kick your feet? Or why are you grinding your teeth? Well, when you go back in human evolution, there is a process called phagosis. This is when two apes confront each other in the bush, one who is in that territory and one who wants to invade the territory. And what they do is they sharpen their canine teeth by grinding their teeth as a display of aggression to try and get that other ape to go away to save them both the damage that a fight is going to cause, right? And so we still, as human beings, engage in that behavior unconsciously in our sleep when we're dealing with stress. We go to sleep, we get to sleep, but there's still these stressful experiences from the previous day and the previous week and the previous month where it's, I'm not going to get the raise I wanted. I'm not going to get the promotion or the IRS is auditing me or whatever the stress in your life is that you can't control. And you fear a threat of this um, that causes you to engage in that behavior. So once again, um, looking at hunter gatherers, uh, they had a very real stress existence because if they couldn't find the food or they couldn't catch the food or they couldn't kill the food and they couldn't bring that food back to the village that was very stressful for them they lost prestige in the village they might not be able to, to procreate because they didn't they couldn't get mates it is a very real part of their existence and we see a very high attrition on the surfaces of teeth in anthropological specimens and whether that was indeed from grittier foods that they ate and chewed or whether it was because they brushed their teeth, we don't know. Is there um, another conversation where we could talk about anthropological things uh, and as part of history and, and, and cultural uh, dent, you know, dentition? I would certainly like to. I'll give you a, a brief. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, um, 
uh, I, uh, I took some anthropology classes as part of my you know, general ed stuff at UC Santa Barbara. And I was, they had, at UCSB had a, a, a really advanced um, uh, department of anthropology and it, it pulled me that direction. I almost mm -hmm. contemplated the possibility that I wouldn't go into dentistry. And then after uh, my dental school, and I had a period of time to wait, my, my first job was this one year at the American Indian Clinic. And then the next job I had was going to New Zealand to teach at the dental school in New Zealand. But that wasn't going to start until the February. And I finished that first year of, uh, in June of 73. And I was, my job was in, in 75. Sorry, sorry, finished it in June of 74. My job was going to start February 75. So I, I went back to UCSB for, I had some months to kill and took some more anthropology classes and met a guy there who was, had been drafted to invest to help the police investigate a murder uh, in San Inez Valley up from here where this guy had been killed by two people and then beaten up with a hammer so they couldn't identify his him from his dental x-rays beat up broke his teeth up with hammers and Phil had his graduate students and me uh, separate the tooth fragments into little cups so we could put his teeth back together and we indeed did that and indeed we were able to identify it through um, the the dental records of this person, mm. and and Phil was an out an outstanding physical anthropologist because dental specimens are are one of the most enduring things that last when you're collecting anthropological specimens. So yeah, it's a field of uh, I'm very interested in and, and always willing to talk about. And and luckily, I had a when I went back to Loyola University for my final year, as I part spent some of it at Loyola, some of the UCSB, and then back for my graduation year, Loyola had merged with Marymount College, a, a women's Catholic girls college in Los Angeles. And my teacher in genetics was Sister Pat, Sister Patricia. And she was probably the best professor I had in my entire undergraduate career. And that's at Loyola, which is a very good school, and UC Santa Barbara, which is a very good school. But I learned genetics from her, I thought, very convincingly. And I, uh, the year that I went back to UCSB in 74, UC, UC Berkeley had just a, made a huge breakthrough in archaeological dating, anthropological dating, uh, with, in, a, in the biochemistry field. Uh, and that was very, very closely tied to genetics. So yeah, it's a field that I have a lot of enthusiasm for. So I'd be happy to talk about that. So the uh, biological title, Lance, that I have in my head is Anthropological Look at Dentition, or we're going to have to come up with a, a better title that has the word leper, leopard hunter gatherer, or have you ever been bit by this? And, you know, some <laughs> scary pictures of teeth. That'll get people to uh, sure. tune into our next yeah, conversation. Sure. Yeah. So we'll wind it down now. And uh, I'm very pleased that, that Lance Mason joined me today for this conversation. We ask you to please give us a thumbs up. Please like and subscribe. And uh, I'm Sifu Slim at SifuSlim.com. And we uh, we welcome your comments below. And until, until the next time, we're signing off big aloha from two caring people that are interested in your wellness and the wellness of society. Great. Listen, I, I'll give myself a, a minor plug if you don't mind. Uh, what ahead. I do with a lot of my life now is writing. And uh, for those of you who um, want to look at a the website, it's uh, lance-mason.com. That's my writing website. And you can look at some blogs and stuff there. And uh, if you just Google it, uh, Google Lance Mason, you'll find various fiction and nonfiction articles and journals that have been published in different places. You might want to get interested in reading some of what you see. There's a there's a an essay, uh, a book of memoirs and essays on Amazon called uh, A Proficiency in Billiards, A Proficiency in Billiards by Lance Mason, which is the old saying "A proficiency in billiards indicates a misspent youth. So there are <laughs> travel essays from basically from. 1970 through 2014 of various places in the world I've lived and traveled and written stuff about. So you might be interested in that. So Lance-Mason.com? Lance-Mason.com is the website and uh, a proficiency in billiards is the book that's on Amazon. Yeah. Short book, about 12 essays of different stuff around the world. That, thanks, that for, thanks for allowing me to plug that. 
No, I wanted you to. I didn't know you had a website, so I'm glad yeah. you, you brought that forward. That, that's all about right. It's got nothing to do with dentistry. But if someone contacts me, I'm more than happy to talk dentistry as well. Okay. Wonderful. Th thanks so much, Lance, and big aloha to, all, to you and all the listeners. Yeah.